I don't want to sort of make this like a charisma contest, right? When we think about what makes a great teacher. For me, it's really about how much thought is going into the design of the experience. One of the books I was recently recommended by uh, a friend and a podcast guest who uh, knows that we like to talk and cover a lot of topics related to not just how learning works, but how can we be better teachers? And in today's workforce, we know that the best managers are leaders, the best leaders are coaches, and coaching is all about teaching at the end of the day. Teaching is the ability to inspire learning. And for that reason, uh, I decided to take this recommendation up on the book by Jim Lang called Small Teaching Everyday Lessons from the Science of Learning. Jim is the director of the Center for Teaching Excellence at Assumption College in Massachusetts. He's the author of multiple books, including On Course, a week-by-week guide to your first semester of college teaching, as well as an author of a monthly column in the Chronicle of Higher Education. He has a esteemed background. Jim spends a lot of his time today consulting and speaking at conferences, conventions, and events uh, across the globe, uh, talking to teachers and instructors, helping them to employ more proven strategies and techniques into their instruction. Hi, me. That means he makes teachers better. Cool. Cool. All right. Pretty cool. So I think that as managers and leaders in the workforce today, we have a lot we can learn from Jim. So we reached out to Jim and Jim said, hey, we'll talk to you. So uh, here it is. Let's bring it in. So Jim, I, I guess maybe just starting off, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about what, what made uh, you know, your background and what made you write small teaching? Yeah, so um, my background is actually in English literature, um, and I have a PhD from Northwestern in that subject. But while I was finishing my time up at Northwestern, I got involved with the Center for Teaching there, Center for Teaching Excellence at Northwestern, the Searle Center. And I became kind of interested in the work they were doing, which was um, promoting better teaching techniques for the faculty at Northwestern. And I found it actually what most interesting in that work was to learn about how people learn and to discover, you know, what what learning learning scientists had discovered about how the brain works and how human beings learn, and then translating those ideas into uh, teaching recommendations. So um, when I left Northwestern, which was in 2000, I uh, became a regular faculty member at Assumption University in Massachusetts and spend spent the next two decades actually um, as a full-time faculty member and also um, running a center like the one I had come from, uh, a center for teaching excellence. And during that time, I just sort of, you know, continued to to read and think about teaching and learning issues. And in the 2016 is when I published the book called Small Teaching. And in that book, I argue, um, you know, a lot of times teachers get our kind of, you know, these administrative fiats, you know, we got to do everything differently. We have to, you know, adapt this new program or get this completely um, re- revolutionary way to, you know, to teach or change all our courses, all that kind of stuff. And I, I kind of realized, you know, it doesn't matter what, which approach you're using. If you pay attention to the small things, um, it can make a m- major difference in terms of the kind of experiences that we create for students. So whether you're using something like game-based learning or traditional lecturing, both those kinds of things, they will benefit from knowing a little something about learning um, and paying attention to like the small everyday choices um, that c- teachers are confronted, confronted with when they are trying to build their courses. So small teaching really just is, is, is got two simple pres- premises. The first is pay, pay, to those, pay attention to those small choices. And the second thing is use learning um, research in order to make better choices. Sure, you know I have. Um, I would show you the whole book here, but it's it's all marked. It's all marked, it's all marked up, Jim. Um, the one of the questions I had is because you speak a lot on this topic, and um, what I guess when you share your point of view and your research, what what surprises teachers most? Like, what is there a specific strategy or tactic that? someone leans back and says, wow, I, I never even realized that. 
Yeah, actually, somebody just asked me this question the other day about like why the uh, chapters of the book are in the order that they put, I put them in. And the reason for that is because the first chapter, which is about retrieval, um, is exactly that topic, that uh, high, uh, college and university teachers in particular don't uh, know very much about and actually don't think is important. And so that, that chapter focuses on how our memories work and how we, um, what kinds of strategies will, us, will, help, will help us um, get information into students' heads. And a lot of high, uh, higher education faculty, well, that's not, that's not important. What I'm trying to do is help students think about like, you know, deep things and kind of stuff like that. But what we've learned is that you can't really think deeply about things unless you know something about them. <laughs> and so um, I think a lot of faculty think, no, I'm gonna skip about that kind of how to teach information or, or core or foundational knowledge. And I'm gonna assume that students are getting that somewhere else or high, from high school or from other courses. Um, but what we really, really learned is that if you want students to become problem solvers, creative thinkers, um, they need to have a foundation of knowledge. And so what we've learned from the learning sciences um, is not that the important thing is not to sort of try to cram information into the heads of students. What's actually important is to help them understand how to get information back out of their heads after they've learned it, after they've been exposed to it. Um, they have to have multiple opportunities to rehearse and recite that information. And what we've learned is that the more times you do that, um, the better mastery you will get of that knowledge. Um, and so you can, everybody, you can see this kind of thing in everyday life. Um, I've always noticed that when I, if a, um, a student in a course, um, and then, you know, a few weeks, the course is over, I'll see that student a few weeks or months later. And if, if, if the first time I'll see that student, I'll notice, um, you know, I might struggle with their name, but if I see the new, that student's name and I say their, not, their name back to them, then that name gets in my head. And I'm able to then be able to remember it the next time, right? So there's lots of these kinds of uh, everyday situations in which you can see this phenomenon um, at work. And so I do like, so that's why I started with that chapter because many faculty members don't know about that research. They don't think it's important. Uh, and I wanted to kind of hook them in um, to say, here, this is clear evidence for this. It's easy to apply. And it's something that will benefit your students. Yeah, the concept of you know retrieval pra practice and especially what you talk about with prediction, you know, predicting mm -hmm. the answer to something before you know it is, uh, it, it seems so powerful yet, you know, anytime I, you know, we try to share that with a manager or an HR leader, you know, in, in, in the workforce space, I'm sure you with teachers, there's just still skepticism, right? Yeah, what totally. is, how do you overcome that? Well, there's a lot of reasons people don't like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Predictional, you know, prediction and retrieval actually you know, work very well together because prediction is something at the beginning of the learning journey and retrieval then is something that you would be able to do after with your learner. Um, so I, I also will talk this about this particular, um, this phenomenon also with faculty and there's definitely pushback about it because um, I think that the goal, sometimes people think, well, I've got this information, I've got to get to the learner. And, and my goal is to focus on how do I get in front of them? But we really know that if, you, if I just come to you right now and say, here's some new information or a, near, a new theory or a new model, the first thing you're going to do is try to figure out how does it fit with the stuff I already know. You'll, you'll try to cram the thing I'm giving to you your, into your existing mental models. Because as all humans, we, we're kind of lazy. And we kind of, if there's an easy way to just learn something and get it into our brains and use it, we'll, we'll take that route. So if, if, uh, you, if I come with you something that's going to really change your thinking, um, there's resistance to that. And so, you know, we all have that. It's not just students. It's not, you know, employees, whatever it might be. That's part of the human brain. Um, it looks for ways to save energy. Um, and so that's kind of the, the problem is um, people want to just think, no, I want to just kind of, I need to give them this information. Well, the information is not going to be, um, it's not actually going to really people's change their thinking unless you figure out first what they're already thinking. And then you can actually tailor their the information, the presentation of that information 
to that person's brain, right? Instead of just sort of having a kind of um, generic presentation of the information, right? Which some people are gonna be like, okay, yeah, sure, I get that. Other people are like, no, I don't believe that. No matter how many times you show it to me and other people, you know, so that people have all kinds of different reactions. So we have to try to figure out what the learner already knows first and prediction is the way to get to that. Um, invite them to say, okay, tell me, what would you think about this? How would you solve this first? Then I'll tell you some strategies that could help you. Sure. Yeah. The I'm sure you have um, through your work and your travel and your experience working with teachers have a perspective on uh, what makes a great teacher. And I think you know, for many listeners here, they may be uh, leaders in in an HR role or in uh, they're a manager of a sales force, and they're trying to, you know, again, not just get uh, people trained up, but continuously developing, which I think in today's workforce is so critical, we never stop learning. Uh, so I share that as the backdrop to the question of like, what, what makes a great teacher? I mean, if you think about what we're trying to do is we're creating to design, we're, we're trying to design learning, learning environments. For, st for students or learners, employers, whatever it might, employees, whatever it might be. So to me, that's what I'm trying to look at is how well are we designing those environments? And you know, when you look at, if I, if I think about my own experience as a student, right? I had teachers who were, had all kinds of different styles, right? Like you had the kind of really charismatic teachers, you had very like uh, low key um, teachers. So, what I try not to look at is like the kind of, for example, the presentation style of the teacher, because, you know, that I don't want to sort of make this like a, you know, um, a charisma contest, right? When we think about what makes a great teacher. So for me, it's really about how much thought is going into the design of the experience. And so, um, you know, you can do that using all kinds of different models, right? Like, again, like, you know, inquiry-based learning and problem-based learning and games and um, traditional le lecturing, these things all can be done well, but you really have to think about the design of the experience. So to me, great teachers are people who um, are thinking about the experience that the learner's gonna have, as opposed to just kind of saying, I've got information, I want you to sort of run through your, the paces on this particular um, assessment, whatever it might be, um, is to continually think about like, What's the learner experiencing? What does the learner need right now? Um, how can, how can I um, provide uh, encouragement for that person? Uh, that kind of thing. So, you know, so I, I, it's me really thinking about the people who have really thought about um, the needs of the learner, the experience of the learner, that kind of thing. One of the things I wrote down from your book uh, was you, you said organizations have a mindset. Yeah, talk that's, about um, so, yeah, I mean, so mindsets are, you know, instead of thinking about people, for example, in an organization that, you know, um, people have, uh, we can think about mind, mindsets as being fixed or growth uh, oriented. So a fixed mindset is a, one which we believe that kind of our, our talents, our skills are kind of having been given to us at birth, you know, and this is kind of how smart we can be, how good we can be at something. And a growth, mind that, growth mindset um, believes that people can improve and that um, we can get better things by practicing them. Uh, so it's not like we just have this you know, little block of talent that we have um, and that that's far as we're gonna go, but to be that people can really improve. Um, and so an organization can really kind of um, embrace that idea and assume that you know, a person ca who came into the organization and had this level of talent doesn't mean that's, you know, they're, they're gonna stay at that spot, right? Like if they're, if they're trained really well, exposed to new ideas, new situations, given the opportunity to let their creativity flourish, um, those, that person might right to the, rise to the top, right? If we have that mindset. Um, I always talk to people about this um, as a, for me as a writer, I wanted to become a writer when I was like, you know, in eighth grade. Um, but the stuff I look back now, when I was in like from high school, it was terrible. Like, so it's like, I had no, you know, I know, I don't think, feel like I had any special natural talent as a writer. Now, I do think there are some people that have, are a little bit more gifted in that area than others, but at the same back, same, same time, 
when I look at my career, right now, having written six or seven books at this point, and, you know, hundreds of articles, and um, that just happened because of practice and because I cared enough, cared about it. And I just, there was a lot of, you know, just um, tens, tens and thousands and thousands of pages, um, which are, you know, buried into my <laughs> old files. And, you know, um, so to me, like that, that's a really, empower it's a powerful way to think about things. And it, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, the other option is to think, no, um, I wasn't given the talent to be a writer. I should do something else, right? And that's really debilitating. Um, and so for both a per people and as an organization, we want to have that more growth-oriented mindset. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, not everybody is lucky enough to have great teachers, right? depending on, you know, where you are and what your opportunities are. You may not uh, be exposed to an environment where, you know, teachers have a growth mindset uh, or parents have a growth mindset or your peers or people around you. I guess, how, how, does, uh, how, how does your recommendations in small teaching and, and things you're seeing, um, how, does it, how does it change or, or what is more, even more important given the different socioeconomic conditions of schools or students or classrooms? Uh, how do you think about that? Well, I mean, on this particular issue, actually, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that are pushing fixed mindsets on to people. I mean, so the, the sort of um, testing that we do, like um, external testing that students uh, encounter in school, which is kind of ranking them, you know, according to like these state or, you know, federal exams. Um, uh, people, the idea, have, people have this idea of the, like your IQ, that, that you're, you're locked into that spot for your life. Um, uh, you know, I have five kids, two of them, the, the twins, the, the youngest ones are just finished the college application process. That, that's another place in which you're kind of, you know, you can, you can apply to this school, but not this one because you're not smart to be this one or the other one, right? So, I mean, the, there's, there's lots and lots of, of, and then actually even in, in writing, actually, I was just, I was just reading um, this uh, poet, with, you know, which was saying, you know, if you didn't have, if you don't have the fire in you and you weren't born with it, you can't be a writer. And I was just going, oh God, I was slapping my hand against my forehead. Um, this is not what we want to be telling people. Um, and so, you know, there is a lot of pushing, there's a lot of societal pressure actually to accept this idea of, um, of keeping us fixed in our, in our sort of the places that we are, are now. So, um, and actually a lot of those things really have a, a major impact on students who are coming from, um, you know, disadvantaged backgrounds. So. Um, you know, we have to just keep promoting the message, right? That um, these messages that not only to the students, but to the teachers to recognize, no, you have to recognize that, you know, even that student who is kind of in the back room uh, of the room, who is maybe misbehaving, there is potential there. Um, and I know sometimes, believe me, I, my wife is, is a teacher. Um, and so sometimes you get really frustrated and um, that can, you know, that, that kid can cause problems 10 months of the year for you. But but still, there's it's possible, right? That, that if, if we if we can use the techniques, if we can um, offer the kind of encouragement and hope that that student might need, um, it can make a difference, and that they can start to, to grow in ways that we we would never expect. So, the message actually has to go out to not only to just the students, in which we should be doing that. We should always be saying to the student, you're, you're you're capable of more, right? That's why you're here in school is to we're, we're trying to get that more out of you but also to students, uh, to teachers and parents um, to recognize that, you know, the way you talked about, you talk to school, talk to your students, your, your children about school makes a difference, right? And don't, you know, um, not discourage you, for, discourage them from going to subjects or trying to do this or that, um, instead of saying, you know what, give it a try, like see what happens, right? And, and um, so it's just a message that we have to keep, you know, trying to promote to, to everybody, like the students, everybody in, involved in education, um, students, parents, and teachers. And, and again, I think what you just said is, is, you know, why it's also so important for uh, managers, C-level executives, you know, folks that are in hiring roles. You know, today we're, you know, just got out of this moment talking about uh, labor challenges and companies finding workers and reskilling workers. I, I, I share that because I think Having an awareness for the things you're talking about, especially in small teaching and the challenges 
um, should better in, uh, inform managers as to why this is so important for them to um, to consider when they build onboarding programs or they're building continuous development structures. And you know, I know I came out of the book with a handful of tools. I'm like, if I could sprinkle this on this process, yeah, you know, whether it's interleaving yeah. or spacing. Is there any, yeah. if, you, if you were to give a manager a piece of advice, you know, there's someone out there that's a first time manager thinking about how do I onboard my, you know, my new yeah. summer class, any, any tips for, for that manager that's trying to figure out how to, you know, teach their people? Yeah, I mean, the first thing is I would just say there, there really has been an explosion of research and resources about, you know, learning and about how we can help people, people from kindergarten st uh, students all the way through employees, right, and, and adults. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of stuff available right now. Um, and so, you know, I, uh, you know, there's lots of books about learning that are accessible to um, people outside of education. So, you know, just get a basic familiarity with some of those kinds of things. Um, it really would make a big difference. And like spacing is a great example of that, right? So we know the thing that we, uh, one thing that we know is much better to space your learning out over a longer period of time than it is to cram everything into one learning session, right? It's like, that has a, that's a clear implication for you, right? So if you're onboarding your employees, don't do like the kind of one day, everything gets thrown at you, and then you're off to start, you're doing your, your, your job, it would be much better to do, you know, eight one hour sessions um, than to do that, than that, that kind of uh, cram exposure, right? So like, you know, to just, and, and that's an easy way to, thing to, to understand and explain to people um, and can be used to design in, in a, uh, an onboarding experience. So, you know, ex, ex, uh, exposure to like five of these ideas immediately will like increase the level of your, the effectiveness of your training, right? By just so, just, you know, a little bit of um, exposure to some of these ideas um, can make a big difference in terms of the design of a learning experience. That's great. And I'm sure you talked about that a little bit and I know your other book, Distracted on Why Students uh, Can't Focus. You probably, yeah. we need a whole another 30 minutes probably to wrap <laughs> on that one. Uh, but yeah. I'm excited to but read that one. Yeah, that's, I mean, the main there is to kind of think about the fact that no learning happens unless there's attention first, right? So you might think about that as even before the point where we can start thinking about how to expose the, the learner to new uh, information, and the design of that, you got to just people get his attention, right? And you have to think about um, what gets in the way of attention. Um, and so, yeah. Sure. And again, too, I think there, there are very small things and practical things that you can do. Um, and learning experiences that, um, you know, that will, again, will kind of benefit the, the learner. Yep. That's great. Jim, uh, last question. Appreciate you taking time. Last question for you. What's your hope for the future of work? Hmm. Well, that's a really good question. Um, so I try to think about the, the um, one of the things actually I talked at the, I talk about in the end of the, one of the final chapters of small teaching um, is about the, the purposefulness of learning, for example. And so how often, um, you know, students are sitting in courses in which they are learning something and thinking, why do, I, why do I care about this? Why do I need to know this, right? And one of the things that we know about learning is that students are more likely to engage in the learning process when they recognize that the thing they're learning actually may, may serve a greater cause. Right, and because it's uh, what we call self transcendence, right? So I can be do something just to benefit myself, or to do something that uh, helps other people. And so, you know, having um, work uh, make it very clear to employers, employees, um, that the, the work they're doing um, has the power to, to improve other people's lives. Um, the more that we can do that, the help we we can sort of help um, work make more meaningful to people. Right. Um, and so, you know, I think that's a thing that we can think about. How do we, and there's actually some of this research that shows, for example, students, uh, people who work in like, who do custodial work, for example, when they're reminded of the fact that you actually, the work that you do helps people keep people healthy and safe, right? So being a janitor or, or a custodian actually is really important in terms of, um, you know, helping people 
working in, in safe and healthy environments, right? So that's what I would like to see more of um, companies do that and, and find good ways to help uh, employees that the, the work that you're doing um, is really making a difference. Um, so I guess that would be the, the thing that I know that actually even watching my two older daughters um, who entered the you know, uh, workforce over the, over the last few years, um, to, to, they're looking for that. They're looking for that meaning in their work. Um, and so I think the more that we can do um, of that kind of thing, um, the more it will help um, people find meaningful um, their careers. That's great. Jim, thanks, thanks for taking time. You bet, thanks. So in today's future of work, like we mentioned, the best, they just get it when it comes to how they develop their people. They spend significant time investing in their own development and the organization's development and capabilities to get the most out of their people. And that includes making sure that the instruction, the things they're coaching, the things they're teaching, they hit home, they're effective and they stick. Uh, I'll rattle off a few of my big takeaways I have written here. Uh, the first was Jim talking about how we need to have companies they remind their people that the work they're doing is making a difference. He also said, great teachers ask themselves uh, what learners need, what's the learner experience, and how can I provide encouragement for that person? He also talked about how being a great teacher means you're always thinking about building a great teaching experience, not just an environment. One of the things we'll close on from Jim's book, growth mindsets within organizations are associated with a wide range of positive, desirable characteristics. He said that companies can have growth mindsets. And I, you know, we've heard this topic before around growth mindsets. If you haven't read Carol Dweck's book on mindset, it's a must, you should pick it up. But the idea in that book is about people having either a growth mindset or fixed mindset. And Jim talks about the idea that a company, an organization itself can have a growth mindset. And he points to this research saying that companies with growth mindsets support more collaboration. They encourage innovation and creativity. They support employees when they try new things and take measured risk. They show fewer unethical behaviors and are overall more supportive of their employees. In sum, they found employees thrive in companies that endorse a growth mindset. You know, the mindset of an organization is largely dependent on the mindset and the approach of the leader. The coaches who day in and day out think about not just how to get their people to perform the tasks that uh, they're assigned, but the ones that can think about how they elevate, inspire, excite the people that they work alongside every day. There's a big difference between working for somebody and working with somebody. And the best leaders create the best organizations that get the best out of their people. So thanks to Jim Lang for joining us on the podcast. I enjoyed it. And again, if you haven't, you should pick up small teaching everyday lessons from the science of learning. Now don't forget to subscribe to Bring It In so you never miss an episode. We've got some awesome guests lined up that you're not going to want to miss. Now, back to work.